child dedication. Parents are to dedicate their children to the Lord and commit to teaching them to do God's will. Here's Dr. Jean Getz to explain this principle. And so what we have here is that God answered her prayer, gave her a son, and uh, she said, I'm going to honor this when he's weaned, which was probably about three years old. And that leads us to verse 26. Please, my Lord, she said, as sure as you live, my Lord, and she's talking to Eli. She's back in Shiloh, probably three years later. God has answered her prayer. She's had this little boy, Samuel. She loves this little guy. She also loves God. I really believe she does, even though she was very immature in many other respects. Please, my Lord, she said, as sure as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who stood here beside you praying to the Lord. I prayed for this boy, and since the Lord gave me what I asked him for, I now give the boy to the Lord. She did not forget her commitment. For as long as he lives, for as long as he lives, he is given to the Lord. And by the way, if you will follow the story of Samuel, uh, you will find later on that he spent many, probably years, back home later as he reached uh, an older age. And uh, that's premature at this point in time, but if you follow the story of what happened, uh, once the, um, the tabernacle at Shiloh was destroyed, uh, and it was because of its sin and evil, that Samuel, there was a long period of time where he probably went back home. Um, and he probably spent time going back home even in between times, because that wasn't that far away. For as long as he lives, he's given to the Lord, and then he, Eli, bowed and worshipped the Lord there. Now, in the New Testament, obviously, the Nazarite vow is not repeated for Christians, but the concept of dedication of our lives to the Lord because of what He's done for us is very present for every one of us. For example, in Romans 12, 1 and 2. Because in Romans 12, 1 and 2, God is speaking to all of us as believers when He says, Therefore, brothers, sisters, by the mercies of God, in view of what God's done for you, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. And it's really interesting the way Paul states that. He says, I urge you. He doesn't even say, I command you. And I think one of the reasons he says it that way is that God doesn't want us to respond to a command. He wants us to respond to His love. He wants to res us to respond with a pure heart, out of thanksgiving, out of praise. I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Paul said, holy and pleasing to God, this is your spiritual worship. In view of what God's done for you, will you respond and dedicate yourself to Him? Give your life to Him. And he explains what that means. Don't be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. So we have a rather uh, all-inclusive concept here in relationship to our lives in dedicating ourselves to Jesus. But we also have, I think, a specific illustration, another sincere commitment, and that grows out of Ephesians 6.4. When we dedicate our children to the Lord, we are also promising with God's help to bring them up in training and instruction of the Lord. When God gives us children, then we are, as believers, to say, I will bring them up to worship you. I will instruct them. I will teach them uh, the will of God. And so this principle is incredibly applicable. I think, to our lives today, which leads to the reflection and response question, which is, in what distinctive ways can we dedicate our children to the Lord and nurture them so that they will live in God's will? There is an enduring principle here of dedication. Even though this is a unique situation, a non-repetitive situation in terms of the Nazarite vow, 
Certainly something God doesn't ask us to do and take our child to the church and leave them there under the tutelage of a pastor. That's never repeated as a command, as a directive. In this case, it's unique in terms of Israel, what was happening in Israel at that, this time, as far as God's will was concerned, God's sovereignty was concerned. But the principle is still significant in the sense that we are indeed to dedicate our children to the Lord. And the way we do that, uh, certainly Deuteronomy uh, illustrates it in a very practical way, which is applicable today, where Moses said to the children of Israel before they ever went into the Promised Land, these words that I'm giving you today are to be in your heart. Repeat them to your children. See, the spontaneous moments. Talk about them when you sit in your house. There are natural moments that come up all the time. When you walk along the road, that was very applicable because they walked everywhere they went. We could apply that by simply saying, uh, when you're driving in your car, or when you're going on a trip, when you're going somewhere, uh, when you lie down, and we, that's forever repetitive because we need sleep, got to put them to bed, which by the way is the most wonderful moment to teach children because most of them don't want to go to bed. And they might say, tell me another story, Daddy. Repeat it, Daddy. Say it again, Daddy. And a lot of times it's because they don't want to go to sleep. Well, take advantage of the moment. Repeat it up to a certain point, obviously. Uh, and when you get up, as you, you face a new day, uh, to, to really thank God for all that He's done for you and for them. It might be at the breakfast table. It might be just a moment before they go off to school. Um, there are all kinds of natural moments when we can do that. And the principle uh, that's pretty clear there from that particular passage, principle 11 in Deuteronomy, uh, tells us that we should take advantage of the teachable moments. We are to use the natural opportunities in our daily routines and relationships to maximize learning experiences with our children. But I also believe that this principle from the Old Testament and from Deuteronomy, not just from 1 Samuel, indicates that it's very appropriate for us to really, literally, dedicate our children uh, to the Lord in a for, more, uh, more formal capacity. Um, and this, there we have to be very careful. Because there are a lot of people who believe that when they dedicate their children, that's a moment of baptism in certain situations, and that's when they're being saved. And the Bible doesn't teach that. Uh, child dedication is not child baptism. If there is child baptism, it should, certainly ought to be interpreted as dedication and not a salvation experience. And I think in some churches they may have a baptismal experience for a child where they sprinkle, but it's clear that that's not a salvation experience. The problem is that there are some people who substitute that experience, that baptismal experience, for believer's baptism. And once the child comes to know Christ personally, they don't follow it up with believer's baptism. And I believe the Bible teaches believer's baptism. Go make disciples baptizing them, baptizing those disciples, baptizing those followers of the Lord Jesus. Uh, so we need to make sure that people do not misinterpret what this experience is when we're dedicating a child to the Lord. It's just simply saying, in a sense, what Hannah said, in essence, what Hannah was saying. Lord, He belongs to you. And one of the things that impacted my life as I grew older, and my mom shared this with me, um, and she grew up in a religious system that didn't practice this, didn't understand this, but my mom listened to uh, a pastor on the radio 
And I was born in 1932, so this takes you way back. And my mom was listening to a battery-operated radio about 100 miles out of Chicago. It happened to be coming from Moody Bible Institute in Chicago on the radio station. But they were airing a message from Dr. Ironside, Harry Ironside, who was at that time pastor of the Moody Church. Now, the Moody Church is different from Moody Bible Institute. But they were airing this message at Moody Church from Dr. Ironside. And following the message, he had a service of dedication for children, where children, parents came forward and dedicated their children. Now, she had never seen it. This wasn't television. But she could imagine people coming down, bringing their babies, Dr. Ironside, praying for those children and dedicating them to the Lord. And my mom told me she knelt there in that little farmhouse, no indoor plumbing, no electricity, uh, just a battery-operated radio in her kitchen. She knelt down holding me as a baby and dedicated me to Jesus Christ. And she shared that with me after I was old enough to understand it, which meant a lot to me. And I sometimes feel, as I look back on my life, it was a very significant moment, not just for my mother, but for me as well. And just knowing that uh, impacts my life and, and what I do with my life. So I think we have wonderful opportunities as parents practice this principle of dedicating our children to the Lord. So let me just restate that principle. Parents are to dedicate their children to the Lord and commit to teaching them to do God's will. And that can be done in many ways. It can even be done in our hearts. It doesn't even have to be a big public demonstration. Although it's wonderful to share that experience with others and ask those people to pray. And dedication services I like to challenge people who know these people who are dedicating the child to join these parents in uplifting them before the Lord, praying that God will give them wisdom in order to rear their children in the admonition of the Lord Jesus Christ.